So let's start by talking about a function of three variables. So suppose E, capital E, is a region in three-dimensional space. So you could think of this as a solid region. So I'll call this an R3. And then let's suppose we have a function that's defined on this region. So a function, remember, takes in a point. For every input, it gives back exactly one output. So let's let f of x, y, z, so the function takes in three variables. So let this be a real function defined on E, on this region E. And so what does that mean? Well, uh, first I want to just sketch a picture. So let's say that our E is just some solid blob in three-dimensional space. So here I've drawn you know, what looks like a blob. It, this is supposed to be filled in. It's a solid region. This is our domain E. And for every point in this domain, so if there's a point that could, you know, when three-dimensional pictures, that could be anywhere. But assume that that's somehow inside of this blob. And this function, our function, whatever it is, our function will assign to this point, it will assign a corresponding value in what I've called the W uh, real line over here. So over here, say this is the output. This is our f of p, and the f is the arrow that assigns to each one of these points in our domain, it assigns a real value. Okay, and so we could say that this f of p is equal to w over here. So a function of three variables is exactly what we would expect it to be. It takes in a point in three-dimensional space, and it outputs a, a real number. And this real number could be thought of as, um, you know, in physical applications, this real number could be temperature, pressure, all kinds of different things. And so these, these kinds of functions are very useful in applications. What we want to know now is how can we integrate a function over a three-dimensional domain. And we will start by simplifying our domain. So let's start by just considering domains that are really, really nice. And so for us, a really nice domain is going to be what we call a box or a right rectangular prism. This is the official name. So a prism is just a, a solid region that's built out of plane regions, so it's got flat sides, in other words. And a right rectangular prism, the reason we call it a box is because it's exactly what you expect a box to look like. So I'm going to sketch a box, and we're going to pretend that it's a right rectangular box. So this is what I want my region to be. So I'm going to call this region B, for again, for box, or right rectangular prism, if you wish. But this is a 3D region, and on this region, defined on this region, we're going to have a function f that's going to output some value w, <coughs> some real number value w. Okay, and now to define the region, I want to give some bounds. So just like in a two-dimensional rectangular region, we want to define our three-dimensional region by the boundaries here. So let's say the x-coordinate goes from a to b, and I'm going to write up here our b is equal to the product of AB cross, and then I'll change colors to go in the other direction so we can see it. In the Y direction, we might have CD. This is looking ex extremely similar to what we did in a two-dimensional region. So what I've just drawn traces out, or fills out, I should say, a two-dimensional rectangle in the base. And then to get our third dimension, obviously, we have to let the z vary. And the z, we could let vary from, this could be anything now. Um, e, f are bad numbers. G, h are usually functions. So let's just say from u to v. Okay, and so then this, this will fill out our entire, so if we have this product of three intervals, this will fill out our entire right rectangular prism. And we want to integrate over this prism. And the question is, how are we going to do such a thing, right? So that what we want to compute is the triple integral over b, triple integral because we have three dimensions now, of our function f dv now. So the, the element that we integrate over, the tiny little piece of our, of our domain, now has a volume. It's a three-dimensional tiny piece. So it's going to have a volume. And we want to define this thing. Um, in a systematic way, and you can probably guess how we're going to do it. We're going to chop up our region into smaller rectangular prisms, so smaller boxes, by just partitioning all the different inter intervals. And I'm not going to focus too much on the main details of this, but I'm going to draw the grid, and then we'll write down the sum, and you guys, hopefully, um, so these are all the lines I'm drawing here, 
our partitions of our intervals. And then as we go through and we partition all the different directions, if you think of the, all the lines I'm drawing right now as slices of our box, then what this is going to do is it's going to chop up our box into smaller and smaller boxes, right? And because it's three-dimensional, we've chopped up all three directions, right? Then we have, <clears throat> what we end up with are smaller and smaller boxes. I'm just going to pick one of them out here. And one small rectangular subprism here, after we've done all the partitioning, this is going to go from, in our x direction, we could say that this will go from, say, xi to xi plus 1. So the interval, that we have i's indexing the x direction. Our y box can go from, say, uh, yj to yj plus 1. And then z, same thing here. So the z can go from zk to zk plus 1. And so the idea is that we have just added, we've just added um, a third partitioned interval to our situation. And we want to compute now, we want to compute the value of the function times the volume. So as we expect here, this is going to end up being like a Riemann sum. We compute the value of the function somewhere for some test point in here. And so we need to choose a test point. And so this test point here, this is going to be like a test point x i j k star, y i j k star, z i j k star. So the x, y, z values are all variable, but they have to be between are inside of this rectangular prism. And so our Riemann sum definition is that we take the limit as what we'll call n, m, and k, all approach infinity. Now we have three sums. So i goes from uh, 1 to n, we'll say. j goes from 1 to m. k goes from 1 to capital K, maybe a poor choice there, but I've committed to it, so we'll stick with it. And then um, we need to evaluate our function at this test point. So x i j k star, y i j k star, z i j k star. And finally, we need to multiply by the volume element. And so the volume element here, the volume of this small rectangular prism, small box, is just length times width times height. So it's going to be delta x times delta y times delta z. So this is going to be delta xi times delta yj delta zk. All right, and if we start comparing, we see our volume element here looks like this. Our function evaluated at the test point is there, no problem. And then as usual, hopefully at this point we're getting used to these Riemann sum definitions. Um, but this whole integral right here is this replaced by this limit. Okay, and so this is, this is how triple integrals, really this is just an extension of the double integrals to triple integrals. Um, this is how we are going to define these things. Um, you can, we've done enough Riemann sums and we know enough of the famous calculus theorems at this point um, that we can expect that we're probably not going to use this definition to compute from all the time or most of the time even. Um, but we need to remember that this is the formal definition that we, we multiply the function by a tiny piece of volume in this case because we have a three-dimensional region. So the function value times a small, tiny, tiny volume element and then we add all those, all those products up, um, and that's what the integral is defined to be. So when necessary, we can always revert back to the Riemann sum definition, and when you do that in practice, you usually chop off this and do an approximation. But um, that's for some future studies.